I'd be lying if I said I wasn't putting off making this video. Hell, I made my longest one to date as an intermission. Why is that? Well, information on the Thunderbirds is quite sporadic. These majestic creatures were a significant part of the beliefs of North American tribes and still are in some cases, but back in the day all the stories were passed on orally without a written word. As a result, most of what I could gather was third hand, of a lacking in detail, painting the legends of the tribes with broad strokes. While I did gather a good chunk of the whole, it is by no means complete, with some cultures being represented more than others. Additionally, there are some motives that I cannot tie to any specific tribe, and do not even get me started on the cryptid side. Listen, there are and were animals that could be the basis for the huge bird, and I'll get to the origins, but trust me, there is no unknown enormous avian darkening the sky. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Where should I even start? Let's begin with the general appearance. Thunderbirds are mostly depicted as eagle, condor or hawk-like gigantic raptors. Each beat of their wings rumbles with the sound of thunder. Every blink is the flash of lightning as they throw snakes to the ground from their talons. These snakes are the balls themselves. Alternatively, the lightning itself may come from their eyes or throat. Teeth or curling horns can occasionally be seen within their beaks. They can be red, blue, yellow, black or a combination of any colors really. White, black, blue and red seems to be a popular variation for totems. Their feathers are about the size of a canoe pedal or so big that they have to be folded in two to fit into a quiver, which is roughly the same size. Canoes are a popular instrument in measuring these creatures though, as another rather modest estimation tells us that these birds have a two canoes wingspan. Admittedly, that is quite huge, but some legends make them appear much more enormous. As you can see, we are already discussing variations, as there isn't that much information of these birds that is consistent throughout. However, some aspects are quite common. They are generally viewed as the protector of mankind, battling horned water serpents, panthers or whales to save their federalist protégés from harm. They uphold balance, often fighting creatures from below that wish to devour the surface. On the other hand, they are also known to punish evildoers and are quite capable at that. Their huge size enables them to carry off grown men, buffaloes or even whales with ease, which suggests a creature larger than the two canoes estimate. They also occasionally possess the power to turn people and objects to stone, but this ability is seemingly only used to carry out sentences. Some tribes also believe that they are shapeshifters, able to take a human form even intermarrying. To achieve such a feat they remove their feathers as if their plumage was no more than a blanket. Following that they just move their beak over their head and they gain a human's visage. Their hybrid of spring are quite gifted and many claim to be able to trace their origins back to a point where such a creature's blood entered their family tree. Thunderbirds appear from the North Pacific coast to the plains and the eastern woodlands. Each tribe has their own version, some differing quite significantly from the rest. I have found a couple of Thunderbird tidbits for a good number of these cultures, and I do think I should list these to write a more complete picture. As complete as I could make it. Alaskan Inuit people call their own variant the Tinmyuk book. It is a large eagle that carries off white caribou to its nest to devour. However, it will also eat a lone human if there is no other option. The Algonquin revere it as an important deity. They believe the Thunderbird, or birds, had a hand in the creation of the universe and are the ancestor to the human race. They are also ones who speak of the eternal struggle between them and the creatures of the underworld. Thunderbirds control the upper world and hurl thunder and lightning at the evil denizens below with their wing flaps. These monsters can either be the Mishipeshu or underwater panthers or the great horn, horn I mean serpent and their followers. However, the Algonquin is a language group and not a tribe. Hence, I list here any individual tribe that belongs here with their own twists on the myth. According to the Menominee, the Thunderbirds wage their endless war against the great horn snake from atop an enormous mountain floating in the sky. They do not only use thunder and lightning in this fight, they have the power to summon hail or rain. They are not indifferent protectors either, occasionally observing the people on the surface. They are delighted by combat and any sort of great feat. 
The Ojibwa believe that the Thunderbirds were created by the trickster spirit Nanabozo, a prominent figure in their mythology. Their purpose is to fight underwater creatures, and not just horned serpents, but all evil therein, and their leader is called Animiki. They arrived from the four directions in the spring with other migrating birds. They waged their war until the most dangerous period of the water creatures passed, moving south with their avian kin in the fall. This might be a reference to floods, but this is only my interpretation and have not read anything similar anywhere else. Nanabozo's creations also punish those who break moral rules, acting with tempestuous anger. If nothing else, fear of their wrath ought to make people behave. While the Agonquain language group is quite numerous, I only found two more tribes with specific beliefs concerning the Thunderbird. A story tells us of a Passamadoki warrior who became a Thunderbird. Two of them embarked on a journey to discover the origin of Thunder, but only he made it north over a magical mountain. There he discovered a tribe who could take on wings and fly. The local adders, in an attempt to explain the origins of Thunder, pounded his flesh and bones in a mortar and formed his body anew with wings, making him one of the birds. The Shoni were avid believers in the fact that Thunderbirds often disguise themselves as humans. In case they'd ever appear as a boy, however, they can be easily identified as they tend to speak in reverse. As for other peoples, the Arapaho viewed the Thunderbird as a creature of summer, not too dissimilar to the role given to it by other North Americans. It was the opposing force to the White Owl which represented the winter season. The Iroquois called the chief of the Thunderbirds, Kenaun, who was tasked to guard the sacred fire, the one and only stolen by Manabush, the Great Hare. The Kwaikutl named him Jojo, while according to the Nootka, his name was... I'm not going to try and pronounce that. For the Woodlands Iroquois, there was a special Thunderbird called Oshadega, which can be translated to Eagle of the Dew. It carried the Lake of Dew on its back in a hollow and flew across the western sky. Its role was to sprinkle this fluid every morning, keeping the land fertile and humid. If a forest was later blazed by demons, Oshadega flew to the sea to bring water and extinguish the flames, routing the dastardly creatures. The Kavaisu, or more precisely the Tubatulabal, who belonged to this ethnic group, spoke of Nichniknuvi, which was probably a thunderbird or something very similar. This monstrous predatory bird hunts humans, taking them to a water hole where it drains the corpse of blood before devouring it. Quite contrasting to other beliefs, but still worth mentioning. For the Siwan people, there is quite a bit of variation concerning the thunderbirds. They generally had the avian creatures as noble fighters who protect mankind from reptilian monsters. Of the Sioux, the Ho Chang in particular believe that if a man has a vision of a thunderbird while on a solitary fest, he is destined to be a war chief as the creature has the power to grant the great abilities. The Lakota called thunderbirds Vakinian or Vaukan, and they believe there were four distinct types, each living at one of the four directions of the far horizon. These variants could be differentiated according to color, but had quite distinctive features regardless. The red ones were large scarlet eagles. The black ones had enormous beaks. The blue ones had no eyes or ears, not that that is a terribly noticeable feature for a bird. And the yellow ones had no beaks. A strange and diverse group, but the calling of all four was thunder. Departing from the Siwan speaking people, the Quilute also have a strong link to the Thunderbird, likely a singular one in their belief. In anger, this powerful avian summoned forth a great flood, making the oceans rise above the mountains. The Quilute survived on boats, navigating the waters with no sun or landmarks for four days. Once the water receded, the people were separated into two groups and neither knew where they ended up. This tale means to tell us how they lost the location of Quilute and were forced to live out their lives in two separate places, Hoch and Chemakan. In the Pacific Northwest, another rather popular story exists, recounting the time the Thunderbird fought the whale. Whale was, unsurprisingly, a whale that was killing other whales. This robbed people of oil and food, causing starvation. As a protector of mankind, Thunderbird came forth and swooped down to battle the Vale. 
After an arduous fight, the feathered savior managed to pick the monster up, rising high above and dropping it to its death. Veil fell from such a height that the impact created the sound of thunder. This story has a few variations, including one where Veil is called Mimlos Veil and manages to escape the bird's claws, fighting it to exhaustion. This is supposedly the reason why orcas can still be found in the sea. Now, there are some other tales I found, but as they offer little additional information, I will not recount them here. Instead, let's move on to a few similar birds, mostly from the mythologies of the Americas. The Cherokee had Lanuva, the giant red-tailed hawk, as their progenitor of these animals. Malasite Pasamakodi people and the western Abanaki spoke of a wind bird. The former called it Vukvozen and the latter Vmola. It was set to sit atop a rock at the northernmost point of the world. Whenever it rustled its feathers the slightest bit, winds swept across the globe. This creature was associated with the frigid air current that blew from the north in the winter seasons. In the beliefs of the Kwakiutl, there existed a cosmic bird called Kanekala, one that brought fire to mankind, not too dissimilar to how Kaneun guarded the sacred flame. There is also a South American being rather close to Thunderbirds called the Xexel. One more creature I could mention here is the Raicho, the Japanese Thunderbird, but it has nothing to do with the American ones, so I leave it up for a possible future dissection. There are two more aspects of these creatures we still need to discuss. Firstly, could there have been any living animals that inspired the tales of these gigantic birds? Well, it is very likely that the Thunderbirds were made up to explain natural phenomena, storms, lightning and thunder. It is rather easy to link an avian to anything that happens in the sky. However, there might very well have been real beings that reinforced these beliefs, so we should not automatically discount these possibilities. The animals most commonly regarded as the basis for these myths are the California and Andean condors. Both can reach a wingspan of 3 meters and live or rather used to live, in the general area which makes them relatively good fits. Not gigantic, but pretty big, and some authentic depictions do make the Thunderbirds appear pretty condor-like. This will be even more prevalent once we get into sightings, but these animals are already a rather likely inspiration, or at the very least, influence. Another similar animal would be the Iolornis incredibilis, one of the largest known birds in North America that were capable of flight. It could reach a wingspan of 5 meters and was presumably similar to a condor in appearance. They have been extinct for at least the past 10,000 years, but they were still present in the Pleistocene. This means that early tribes could very well have coexisted with these beasts, likely fueling many of the man-eater and wrongdoer punisher birds of legends. Another, even larger bird was the Argentavis Magnificens, a huge teratorn with a wingspan possibly exceeding 6 meters. However, this animal is not as good a fit. Firstly, we only have fossil evidence from South America, so it is unknown whether they frequented the regions where thunderbirds were worshipped. Another caveat is that these bones can be dated back to the late Miocene, so we do not know whether these beasts were even alive by the time human tribes conquered these lands. There is a huge gap between the fossils and the first possible tribes of the continent, so it is on the unlikely side. However, their remains could have been found all the same, much like how dinosaur bones spark mystery. Which brings us to creatures that lived even further back, pterosaurs. Now, obviously these animals had no business being alive by the time human feet stepped onto these lands, however their fossilized remains, especially the skulls, could certainly have played a part in the legends of a few tribes. Species with teeth might have been the cause of Thunderbird depictions complete with dental features. Their crests might have promoted the idea of crested versions, something that we could not expect from a condor-like creature. The wingspan of large pterosaurs could easily exceed 10 meters, but even if the wing bones were not perceived as such, the skulls are huge, much larger than what a similarly sized bird would have. These are flying creatures that might have inspired the tales, but there is one more to reinforce it, the Titanis genus. These were large predatory birds with diminutive wings and massive beaks. They've gone extinct about 15,000 years ago, so it is quite possible humans have seen them. You might be wondering how such a clearly flightless animal could inspire ones that literally live above the world. Well, 
Due to their proportions, they might have been regarded as merely chicks of the actual animal. If so, it is not a surprise why Thunderbirds were thought to be colossal. Quite a few possible origins, which might very well have had a conjoined effect. The reason I wanted to share all these before the next section is because I'm now going to briefly discuss the cryptozoological aspect of Thunderbirds and I wanted you to already know likely culprits, if any might come up. Needless to say, there are people who believe that the extinct animals who might have had a wing in the creation of these myths are actually still alive. This search is rather misplaced as we are talking about gigantic birds or pterosaurs, which are not easy to miss. It is practically impossible for these animals to remain hidden, not to mention the difficulty they would face while trying to gather enough food to sustain a large enough population not to be subjected to the effects of a genetic bottleneck or outright inbreeding, especially in the fragmented natural site of today's North America. However, I do want to do my due diligence, so I will recount the most famous alleged Thunderbird sightings. One of the earliest examples happened in Arizona, 1890. Two cowboys shot at and killed a huge creature resembling a bird in the desert. It had a wingspan of 160 feet, which is almost 50 meters in grown-up numbers. This is bordering on the impossible. Nah, it has already tripped over it and fell down the stairs of incredibility. The two cowboys also claimed that the animal had a smooth skin and leathery, bat-like wings, as well as the head of an alligator. One might assume that this fits the description of a pterosaur, but only very vaguely. Most of these prehistoric reptiles actually had pycnofibers covering much of their body, which are hair-like filaments. Also, few of these animals had a head that could be likened to an alligator more than a bird, and even fewer of that size, as simply put, None were that enormous. They also claimed that the beast was already wounded or sick when they found it. The thing tried to take off, but it fell after flying for roughly 8 kilometers, and the cowboys finished it with rifles. Yeah, very plausible story. Next! Another report entails a condor like bird with a 6 to 9 meters wide wingspan. It was also killed in the 1800s, but it is not clear when exactly. However, allegedly, there was a photo taken of it, where it was said to be strung up with outstretched wings against the barn, with six men holding outstretched arms, fingertip to fingertip, to show the size. It was even published in the tombstone epitaph. That's great news, right? That epitaph was lost without any surviving copy. The image you see before you has been redrawn from memory. The description and the image do not line up perfectly and it is likely that both have flaws. The most plausible answer is that this was a California condor, the size of which might have been unusual, but was certainly exaggerated in the reports. In 1868, the 8-year-old Jimmy Kenny was snatched from a schoolyard in Tippa County, Missouri. The enormous bird tried to carry it off, but struggled heavily and the commotion down below caused it to drop the kid. Unfortunately, he died from the fall. Condors usually do not go hunting, instead feeding on carcasses, but this is not too far-fetched a scenario. Given the boy was lean enough, the bird might have managed to carry it off some distance, thinking it was an easy meal. The next story seems to support this idea. It happened in July 1977. People spotted a thunderbird in Lawndale, Illinois. On the 25th, three young boys were attacked by the creature at 9 p.m. One of them was carried off for about half a meter, but the bird could not bear the weight any further and dropped him. He only suffered minor scratches and described the animal as black with a white ruff. It was very likely a condor. Another sighting of Thunderbird occurred in the July of 2001 in Pennsylvania. It was said to have been grayish black, sporting a long beak with a 4 meter wingspan and a meter in length. Now estimations are seldom correct when it comes to flying creatures, as there is usually no other object in the sky we can compare them to. Therefore, this might have been a heron or similar bird with different proportions. Perhaps a great blue heron? Color is not quite right, but it is relatively large and long. It was seen again in September, but no picture was taken to my knowledge. In 2002, off the coast of Alaska, another thunderbird was spotted. It is widely believed that the animal was a stellar sea eagle, which do not live in North America, but have been occasionally found to venture there. 
a big eagle with a roughly 2 meter wingspan, but not that massive in comparison, shows you how unreliable witnesses might be. That's basically all I gathered. Not that short, but still seems like a fraction. However, we still have one more part to go over, a realistic version. Well, this is possibly the easiest one yet. There are already a couple candidates, but I should not cheat and actually try to make a new thing. So Condor version is pretty much covered, also making an animal the size of a mountain is not feasible, especially if we also want it to fly. History tells us that anything with a 4 meter or wider wingspan is unlikely to be able to sustain itself in a modern environment. Therefore, what would be a nice addition is a rather large ego that resembles the Thunderbird, maybe shares some features beyond resemblance. The Harpy Eagle is a good start, I'd say. While it lives in South and Central America, it already has the crest, a similar size, and a not too dissimilar coloring. We can make a new species in the same genus, so let's begin with a carbon copy. Increasing a bit in size is not unfeasible, although I'd still keep it smaller than a California condor. Say, a wingspan ranging from 2 to 3 meters should not be too overboard, but could appear quite impressive soaring the skies. I think slapping the common totem colors on the animal isn't that detrimental either. Sure, a bit more noticeable if we go with red, but the plumage without camouflage is not a novel concept among raptors. It could easily be linked to signaling strong genetics, as is often the case for birds. This is practically the final look. Not too unique a beast, but there are still a few modifications we need to make. Also, I told you in advance this is going to be a simple one. Let's think of the habitat too. Now, obviously such a large predatory bird would have to fight a fierce competition with other raptors living in the area. We could offset this newfound conflict if we make it migrate. It is, after all, referenced in the myths, appearing with their avian kin in the spring and leaving during fall. Now, why would that be? Regular harpy eagles primarily feed on relatively large mammals like sloths and monkeys. This means the thunderbird could instead hunt birds, lessening the overlap between the species. As their prey migrates, a good portion of these animals go with them to greener pastures, but spending most of their time on the northern continent. Alright, but how would we link it to thunder, lightning and storms? Naturally, electric eel style shocks are out of the question for an animal on dry land. If we make the wing flaps really loud, imitating thunder, that's not good either. Such a predator is pretty easy to notice. There is one option though. Right before a storm, when air pressure drops, insects are usually quite agitated and active. Several birds use this opportunity to fill their bellies, which makes them pretty active as well, swooping across the sky quite close to the ground. A predatory bird that is aware of this might position itself on a perch when the pressure drops, snatching other birds as they snatch insects. Admittedly, this would be a semi-rare occurrence, and the rest of the required calories would still have to be obtained through regular hunting, but it is a feature that coincides with an important aspect of the Thunderbird, the storms. Those unaware of all this might very well believe that the coming of these birds brings the storm, and not vice versa. Additionally, these relatively easy snacks could facilitate the large size. As expected, I'd not add teeth or a shape-shifting ability. The first is detrimental, the other is impossible. However, as an added little flair, we might see these birds actually hunt for water serpents on occasion. A large enough snake lifted up high and dropped onto rocks is a sizable meal that is only mildly dangerous to get. Veal carcasses being feasted upon by a few thunderbirds, among the largest animals to do so, only surpassed by condors, they could appear as the ones to have coated, with some embellishments of course. These are all the features we can feasibly put onto the real animal, I think. Turning stuff to stone, lacking beaks or eyes, a lake of dew on their back, these aren't going to make it in, I'm afraid. First the siren and now this, you are getting lazy with these realistic versions. Yeah, well, not everything can or has to be far-fetched. Maybe I'll have something stranger next time. That's it for this episode though, hope you've enjoyed it and thanks for watching this long. If you'd like to discuss monsters, world building or practically anything, I'd like to invite you to my Discord channel. You can join via link in the description. Hope to see you next time as well. Bye!